appreciate that. So I'm going to be giving you a, a talk today on alkali silica reaction in concrete, really focusing on reliability of accelerated laboratory test methods and talking a little bit about mitigation procedures. So it's nice to be at least a little bit further on the West Coast. I don't maybe have to explain to everyone where Oregon State is, but just so we're all on the same page, Oregon State University is south of Portland by about 90 miles. And we were founded in 1868. We're one of only two universities in the United States that's designated as a land, sea, space, and sun grant university. The other one is on the East Coast, and that's Cornell University. So we're a fairly decent sized university. We have about 24,000 students, do a good bit of, of research, and we have a really beautiful campus right there in, in Corvallis. One of the things that I really like is that we're very close to skiing. So maybe not quite as close as Salt Lake City is, but we're, we're pretty close, and I'm a big skier, so I really appreciate that. So for the talk today, I'm going to be talking about correlating accelerated laboratory tests, also correlating them to field performance. And I'm really going to focus on test methods. So the test methods that we use in the laboratory to predict the potential for aggregate reactivity from ASR. I'm going to be fairly direct about test methods that I personally and that kind of the larger research body recommends and those that we don't recommend and what the pitfalls are with the tests that we don't recommend. Um, but there are challenges with all of the test methods that we have and we'll kind of see that throughout the talk. We'll also highlight some research results that my research group has been working on for the past few years and also some work that I was involved with when I was at the University of Texas before coming to Oregon State. And then at the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you just a brief snapshot on what's going on in the United States in terms of managing the larger body of alkali aggregate reactivity. We have two documents that are out now, one from the Federal Highway Administration and one from AASHTO on kind of a unified approach to preventing and assessing the potential for deleterious reactivity from alkali aggregate reaction. Um, I'm also involved right now with ASTM and trying to develop a guidance document that also provides unified information for everyone on alkali aggregate reactivity. And then we'll wrap up with some perspectives and plenty of time for questions. So just to kind of bring everybody on the same page, if you're not familiar with alkali silica reaction, it is an internal reaction that occurs inside the concrete. We really need three main things for ASR to occur. You need a reactive source of silica in the aggregate. So don't walk away thinking all aggregates are reactive. And even if an aggregate has a reactive siliceous component to it, it really depends on the concrete mixture and the environmental conditions that it's exposed to if it's going to be reactive. But you've got to have a reactive form of silica in the aggregate. We also need alkalis for the reaction, and those come from the Portland cement, namely. They can also come from aggregates, and they may also come from supplementary cementitious materials. But for the most part, we're talking about alkalis from cement. And you need moisture, so you need water for the reaction to progress. So if you don't want to have ASR in your concrete mixture, you have to eliminate one of these three issues. And it may not be an, an, an option. You know, We may not be able to limit those, so we're going to have to look at other ways to potentially mitigate or limit the reaction. Things like inclu including supplementary cementitious materials, or chemical admixtures, or aggregate beneficiation. And so I promise this is not a chemistry lesson, but just a brief overview. This pore solution that's inside concrete has a very high pH. Think something like Drano. It's a pH around 13 to 14, typically. And it's this high pH and the presence of hydroxyl ions in the pore solution that react with the reactive silica in the aggregate to form a gel. This gel then imbibes alkalis, and that's where the term alkali silica gel comes from. Once that gel has formed, it's hygroscopic, meaning it wants to draw in water. So if there's moisture present, the gel is going to draw in water, and it's going to expand. And if the expansive, force, the expansive forces from the reaction can overcome the tensile capacity of the concrete, you will get cracking in the concrete. So that's really the, the basics of alkali silica reaction. And this occurs inside the aggregates as well as on the exterior of the aggregates. And once that gel has formed, it can exude into the paste and cause more expansion and swelling of the entire matrix. <coughs> 
So this is kind of the outward manifestation of ASR. This is typically what we would see in a concrete structure or element undergoing ASR. This is a pavement section. This is actually I-84 just outside of Boise, Idaho. And this is a, um, a footing for an electrical power generation station in Texas, and you can actually see that this top mat of steel is separating from the bottom mat of steel. There, wasn't actually, there weren't actually any stirrups in this mat, but you have a massive amount of cracking going on just from ASR. And then on the right-hand side, this is a footing for a bridge outside of Quebec City that has been undergoing massive ASR for about the past 70 years. Interestingly enough, this structure was actually taken out of service over the past year due to ASR, but also due to corrosion in the structure and due to freeze-thaw attack. So a lot of times ASR doesn't necessarily lead to the eventual loss of integrity of a structure, but because it starts cracking, it opens up the fast path for other forms of attack. So chloride ingress can be a concern, carbonation can be a concern, all of those that would affect reinforcing steel and corrosion and freeze-thaw attack as well. Sulfate attack may also be a concern. But we're really just going to focus on ASR today. So if you walk away with nothing else from this presentation, walk away with the idea in your head that proper test methods and knowing what your test method tells you is critical to assessing the potential for aggregate reactivity and the potential for what your mitigation options can do. I'm using an example here. This is the Mactaquac Generation Station. This is a hydroelectric dam in New Brunswick, Canada. At the time that it was built in the late 1960s, they used a test method to see if the gray wacky aggregate that they were using was potentially susceptible to ASR. The test method that they used was the ASTM C227 mortar test. These are small prisms, one inch by one inch by 11 and a quarter inch, that are stored over water at 38 degrees Celsius. And at the time, this testing showed that the aggregate was non-reactive. So it was the locally available material. It was what was right there at the, the dam site when they were doing the excavation and constructing it. They built the dam. But after about five to 10 years, they started to notice expansion in the structure. And what is now very well established is that this structure has active alkali silica reaction going on in it. They spend about six to seven million dollars every year just to accommodate the expansion that's going on in the dam. They do slot cutting to remove concrete out of the dam. They also have to put in flexible couplings in pretty much every single piece of piping, tubing, network that they have in the structure. This dam was about a service life projected for 150 years. It's really only going to last for about half of that. And in the year 2025, they're going to have to completely replace the dam because they just can't keep up with the amount of ASR that's going on in the structure. So if you have more questions, I can talk a lot more about this structure. But it's really to highlight the fact that even though they went through and did what they thought was the right testing at the time, the test method wasn't really the right test method. And so it didn't pick up the potential reactivity in the aggregate. OK, so this leads us into talking about test methods. So pretty much everything that we do in the laboratory is some way to accelerate this reaction, something to do it on a shorter period of time to pick up the potential for reactivity. And this slide just kind of summarizes that with all of our different testing methods or strategies, as we work from really looking at what real structures are doing, so the same aggregate type that's already been in an existing structure, if we're looking at that as a field performance record, that's really our most reliable means of assessing if an aggregate could be potentially reactive, is looking at field performance. But as we work through accelerating the tests, we get decreasing reliability in the test method, meaning it doesn't really capture well what's going on in the field. But the caveat is that we have increasing time. No one's going to take an aggregate, put it into a structure, and wait for 50 years before they construct with that aggregate again. So another thing to walk away with is it's really about a balance of using as many different pieces of information that we have to make an assessment about that potential for reactivity. So I put on the right-hand side, what does our ideal test method do for us? So the ideal test method is rapid. It's obviously reliable. And perhaps really important, it's capable of determining the performance of a real job scale mixture. So I want to be able to assess that actual job mixture in the lab that I'm going to be putting out into whatever the structure is and get some idea, is this going to be potentially reactive? We want to be able to take into account the influence of the aggregate reactivity 
We'd like to be able to know the influence of alkalis coming from the cement. Remember, those alkalis are a key part of the reaction. And we want to take into account exposure conditions. Everything that we do in the lab is under a very controlled condition. But what's actually happening in the field where we're going through wetting and drying and we're going through temperature changes? But unfortunately, we don't have this test, OK? This just simply does not exist right now. It really is a need that the industry has. It's something that researchers are working on developing. But I will tell you, getting this ideal, this ideal test is very challenging. So I think we really have to rely on a suite of tests. We have to rely on our best practices documents. And we can't just use a one-stop shopping approach for looking at a, a laboratory test. So this is kind of a hit list of our commonly used ASR test methods. And what I've done is I've highlighted in orange what are our recommended test methods based on the research knowledge that we have now, based on field performance, and based on all the work that we've done, what are the best test methods that we would recommend? So ASTM C295 is the standard guide for petrographic examination of aggregates. This is a great test where a petrographer can look at the sample of aggregate and identify if there are potentially reactive phases there, just to even know, do we have a potential for a reaction? Then there are three tests after this that I've put into light gray, because they're test methods that I would not recommend using. That's the ASTM C289 test, which is a quick chemical test. ASTM C227, I mentioned that was the test that was used to assess the aggregate reactivity for that dam in New Brunswick. And ASTM C441, and I'm going to talk about these each individually, so we're, we're going to come back to them. On the recommended test side, we have two tests that test mortar bars, ASTM C1260 and ASTM C1567. So these are mortar specimens, meaning we have a fine aggregate, cement or some cementitious materials combination, and water to make up that mortar. This is not a concrete test. The only test that we have that's a standard that's a concrete test is the ASTM C1293 test or the concrete prism test. And we would say that these are they're the recommended tests. So let's go through and talk about these in a little bit more detail. I think first of all, though, if we're looking at just an idealized graph, if we were to plot our expansion in this accelerated test on the y-axis, and we were to plot our expansion in a real structure, the ideal relationship that we have is a line of equity. So that the test in the laboratory tells us exactly what's going to happen in the field. In this lower left-hand quadrant, this green quadrant, this would be an area where both would pass. So an aggregate would pass the laboratory test, and it would show no deleterious expansion in the field. In this quadrant, in the upper right, this would be a fail-fail relationship, where the laboratory test tells, tells us that it would fail, and the structure would also have a deleterious reaction. That's without any mitigation option. And these are certainly the areas that we want to fall into, that we get good agreement within the test. However, if we start to get expansions that fall in either this quadrant on the upper left or on the lower right, we have disagreement between the tests there. Okay? And those are the areas that we want to avoid with our testing methods. So I mentioned the ASTM C227 test. This is a mortar test. It's a 25 by 25 by 285 millimeter long prism. This is a 1 inch by 1 inch by 11 and a quarter inch mortar prism. And it's stored over water at 38 degrees Celsius. One of the biggest problems that we have in this test, though, is that we get a lot of leaching in the test. So this very small bar size stored in a high humidity environment over water allows leaching of the alkalis out of the prism. If we're leaching out one of the main reactants that we need, it's going to show a lower expansion, and it's not going to give us a real result. It's also been shown that it has an inability to assess a great number of rock types, gray wackies, argillites, quartzites, metavolcanics. And basically, the reason why is that these are our slower reacting aggregates. These are our slower alkali silica reactive aggregates. And so over time, because we're leaching alkalis out of the prism, we don't have as much fuel to drive the fire. And we would show that a lot of these aggregates would not be reactive in the test, when in fact, if we put them into a field structure, they could be reactive. So this is not a recommended test method, either for identifying aggregate reactivity or for identifying prevention levels or mitigation options that we would use to prevent the reaction. 
The ASTM C441 test is virtually identical to C227. It is also a mortar prism, the same exact size, but this is used to evaluate the efficacy of a supplementary cementitious material. The challenge with this test, though, is that instead of using the actual reactive aggregate that you're trying to assess, it uses Pyrex glass. So we have a highly silicious glass that's highly reactive to assess the ability for a supplementary cementitious material to control the reaction. So it doesn't really give us an idea of what's happening in the field. It may be a tool that's okay to assess how a supplementary cementitious material performs, but it doesn't tell you anything about how that's actually going to perform in the field because we're not assessing the aggregate type that's being used. So when we talk about the test methods that we do recommend, the ASTM C1260 test is one that we would recommend. It's the same size mortar prism, a one inch by one inch by 11 and a quarter inch prism, but instead of being stored over water at 38 degrees Celsius, it's actually submerged in a one normal sodium hydroxide solution and cured at 80 degrees Celsius for two weeks, so 14 days of exposure, or even up to 28 days of exposure. <coughs> and they're monitored for length change over time. So we're at least addressing the issue here of the leaching of alkalis. We have an infinite supply of alkalis coming from the sodium hydroxide and a very high temperature. But this test is not without its drawbacks. It's, oftenly conser it's, it's oftentimes considered overly severe. We have a very aggressive storage solution with one normal sodium hydroxide. We have a very high temperature of 80 degrees Celsius. So in general, it should only be used to accept and not reject aggregates. But I think one of the concerns that we're starting to see with this test is that we also see aggregates that pass this test but then fail in our concrete prism test or fail in structures. So there are drawbacks to this test as well. So a caveat here is that aggregates failing the test should really be confirmed with some other um, some other test method, either looking at a concrete prism test, looking at historic field records, looking at the performance of those aggregates in the field, or going to ASTM C295, a petrography test, so that you really develop a bit better information about the aggregate and its potential for reactivity. So ASTM C1293 is the, also called the concrete prism test, and now we're actually testing a concrete mixture. So this is a three inch by three inch by 11 and a quarter inch specimen. The specimens are stored over water at 38 degrees Celsius for the period of one year. And we boost the alkali level in the prisms. So we start at a one and a quarter percent sodium oxide equivalency. We do also get leaching in this test, but due to the larger concrete size, the leaching is much less pronounced than in a mortar bar test. But we still do have to start with a higher level of alkalis in the test. And this is really considered the most reliable test method with the best correlation to field performance. Is it a perfect test? No, it is not a perfect test. There are still drawbacks with this test as well. Probably the, the three biggest issues are that it still does not allow the testing of a job mixture, meaning you have to follow the proportions and the alkali loading for this test to pick up the reactivity of the aggregates. It also can't assess the alkali loading in a mixture. So you can't assess using a low alkali cement in this, in this test because any low alkali cement is already going to start at a level where you have so little alkalis in the system that it's going to leach them out and it won't have enough fuel to drive the fire like you would in a larger element in the field where you don't have those leaching issues. It's also one year long for assessing aggregate reactivity, so it's a very long test. So this is the drawback to this test as well. Okay, so just to, to kind of summarize, what the, aggreg the aggregate recommended reactivity tests are ASTM C1260 and ASTM C1293. But I think I've highlighted that there are drawbacks with these tests also. They're not the ideal tests. We really need a better test to assess what's going on in the field. So one of the, the things that our research group has been involved with and that I've been involved with for really the past seven or eight years is the use of outdoor exposure block testing to provide benchmarking for these accelerated laboratory tests. I'm not recommending that everybody goes out there and builds an outdoor exposure site and starts testing blocks. But 
it is critically important to have these sites in different environmental exposures throughout the world so that we can benchmark our laboratory tests and so that we can benchmark new versions of laboratory tests to see how well everything is actually going to perform in the field. So we've kind of arrived at a standard block size for all of these sites. It's a 300 by 380 by 720 millimeter block. It uses a fairly high cement content. We boost the blocks much like we do in the concrete prism test, but we also run unboosted blocks. So we also run at a high, still a high alkali level, but not at a one and a quarter percent. And really the great thing about this test is that the concrete blocks are stored in outdoor exposure conditions. So we're really able to get an idea of the environmental performance of the concrete mixtures. And we run concrete prism tests at the same time that we do these outdoor exposure blocks. Okay, so I've mentioned most of the comments here, so we'll, we'll move forward. But just to show you a snapshot of the main exposure sites that our group is working with now, and these are some of the main exposure sites that exist throughout, um, throughout North America. There's a very large site at the University of Texas at Austin. That's what I was involved with when I was there working on my master's and PhD. There's also a site at CANMET or MTL, and this is kind of the Canadian Standards Association. This is in Ottawa, Canada, and through their Natural Resources Division of their government. We have an exposure site at the University of New Brunswick, so very close to where that dam is. And we have an exposure site just off of the coast of Maine at Treat Island. So we can really get an idea of different exposure conditions where we have high temperature and also high humidity for a large portion of the year. We've got cooler temperatures in both of these sites, and we have a very aggressive marine exposure site here in, in Treat Island. We're also building a site at Oregon State University at our labs um, inland. We're looking for a site at the coast. And Houston is also going to have a, a coastal exposure site also. So we're really looking at all of these outdoor exposure sites to provide benchmarking information for these accelerated laboratory tests. So I, I like this graph because it does a good job, I think, of illustrating the importance of specimen size on alkali silica reaction. And so in the lower, the lowest line here, what you see are these mortar bars. So these one by one by 11 and a quarter inch prisms. As we go to a slightly larger size to concrete prisms, and then as we move into larger scale concrete blocks. And what you see is that the alkali loading is plotted here on the x-axis. So these are the alkalis namely coming from our Portland cement and expansion on the y-axis. So in order to pick up the potential for reactivity of an aggregate, we really have to get to a higher alkali level in the cement just from the leaching effect with these smaller specimens. You can see at the larger specimens where we don't have that pronounced leaching effect, we see that we get a higher expansion and we get the expansion occurring earlier on. So I think this really helps to drive home the idea that leaching is a real problem in these accelerated laboratory tests. And we've got to move to larger sizes or to an increased alkali loading in the concrete mixtures to pick up the potential for reactivity. Okay, so if we know that we've got the potential for reactivity, we want to do something to still use that aggregate source. So this is just kind of a snapshot of the main mitigation techniques that we use for ASR in fresh concrete. So this isn't addressing what happens when we have hardened concrete already undergoing ASR. This is what we would do for fresh concrete. So most supplementary cementitious materials can be used to control alkali silica reaction. It's very much a function of the components and the composition of the supplementary cementitious material. I've highlighted some of the main important ones here. The calcium oxide content, the silica dioxide content, the alumina trioxide content, and the sodium oxide equivalency in those mixtures really plays an important role on how effective they're going to be at controlling the reaction. The dosage rate is also very important. So one thing to walk away with is that I mentioned most SEMs can be used to control ASR. You may need higher volumes of certain supplementary cementitious materials to control the reaction for a highly reactive aggregate. It also depends on the nature and level of the reactivity of the aggregate and that alkali content coming from the Portland cement. Lithium can also be used to control ASR in fresh concrete, and I've underlined this in fresh concrete. It may also be used in combination with supplementary cementitious materials. So let's say you have a very high volume of fly ash that's required to control ASR, but that's going to 
result in a negative impact on your constructability. You may be able to look at combining a lower dosage of that fly ash with lithium or a lower dosage of that with another supplementary cementitious material to basically improve your constructability of the mix without impacting the alkali silica resistance. One thing that's really important to mention about lithium, a lot of research has come out in the past couple of years to highlight that a, a one stop shopping dosage for lithium does not work for all aggregate types. The amount of lithium that you need to control the reaction is highly dependent on the aggregate reactivity level and also on the form of lithium, whether you're using lithium hydroxide, lithium chloride, or lithium nitrate. And I would say namely on the market now, the main commercially available lithium is lithium nitrate. Lithium chloride and lithium hydroxide really aren't used much due to their drawbacks. And we can talk about those later if you have questions. Also restricting the alkali contribution may be a way to mitigate ASR. Alkali loading is key, not just the percentage that's there. And just to mention though that using low alkali cements may be highly energy intensive. So it may not necessarily be as sustainable an option as using supplementary cementitious materials. And certainly you can avoid using reactive aggregates, but in most cases I think we'd all realize that that's really not going to be an option. We're not going to be trucking in aggregates from thousands of miles away just to get an aggregate that's not reactive. Okay? So I'm going to talk um, just a little bit about almost the same methods that we recommend for testing aggregate reactivity are the same recommended methods for assessing how well a supplementary cementitious material will control the reaction. So the ASTM C1567 test is basically the identical test to ASTM C1260. It's just rebadged to allow you to use supplementary cementitious materials in the cementitious portion of the mixture. One thing to mention is that this standard right now does not allow for the testing of lithium nitrate. There is a version that can be used, and that is in the, a recent Federal Highway document, and I have that reference a few slides later. But this version of the test as it stands right now does not allow the testing of lithium nitrate for assessing, aggregate re for assessing its mitigation potential. The other um, option is to do the concrete prism test. Again, it's identical except that you replace a portion of the Portland cement with the supplementary cementitious materials that you're interested in investigating. But that testing duration extends out to two years now. And you can use lithium nitrate in this test, again, out to a two-year duration. Okay, so I know this looks like a large scatter plot. Think back to that very, one of the very first slides that I showed you showing that ideal relationship between expansion in an accelerated test and expansion in the field. Here it's a little bit different where we're showing expansion in that ASTM C1260 test or that accelerated mortar bar test at 14 days and expansion in the concrete prism test at two years. Our expansion limit for the concrete prism test is 0.04% at two years for assessing supplementary cementitious materials. So that's somewhere right here. Our expansion limit in the accelerated mortar bar test is right here at 0.10%. And what I've actually shown in this figure, and this is a figure from a, a recent paper, are the, the standard deviations basically. So we know how much inherent um, lack of reliability there is in the test. So this is showing that for the concrete prism test it's 0.04 percent plus or minus 0.018 percent and for the accelerated mortar bar test 0.10 percent plus or minus 0.03 percent. And so the cluster of results that we have in the lower left or the upper right hand quadrant those are good results because they tell us that the accelerated, the ultra accelerated test at 14 days is correlating very well to the two-year concrete prism test. However, what is, what's of a concern to us is the values that we have in the lower right and certainly this cluster of values that we have in the upper left here. So there are still discrepancies in this test. We do still have disagreement and we're actively working to try and, try and figure out exactly why that is and to try and benchmark that to some of these, these outdoor field sites. But I think with reasonable confidence we know that an expansion limit of 0.10% at 14 days corresponds very well to the two-year concrete prism test and it also corresponds very well to long-term field structures that we have. But there are still challenges that we have to overcome. Okay, so this is just a, a figure to highlight that almost any supplementary cementitious material when used in the right quantity can be used to control 
an, an, a reactive aggregate. So this shows a, a fairly highly reactive aggregate. This happens to be the Sprat limestone aggregate out of Canada. And this black line shows you the control. So this is a concrete mixture without any mitigation options in it. And at one year in the concrete prism test, we would be at about a 0.24% level of expansion. If we start including slag as a replacement level for the Portland cement, you can see that as we increase the amount of slag, we're decreasing the amount of reactivity in the sample. But 25% slag is just not enough. We really need to get to about a 50 or 65% level of slag to really control the reactivity of this aggregate. I'm going to skip over this one just, to, just, in, the interest of, just in the interest of time. So, that's just kind of a snapshot on the main test methods that we recommend for assessing aggregate reactivity, as well as for assessing the ability for a supplementary cementitious material to control the reaction. And what I'm going to do is now just give you a little bit of an update on some of the research that we have going on at Oregon State University. So one of the projects we've been working on is testing recycled concrete aggregate for ASR susceptibility. And so our main research goals for this project were to see if we could even use these accelerated laboratory tests to pick up the potential for reactivity when recycled concrete aggregates are used in new concrete. We also wanted to examine the effect that crushing or processing of recycled concrete aggregates has on reactivity. We wanted to look at mitigation strategies to see if the same mitigation strategies can be effective for recycled concrete aggregates and to start to give some guidance on assessing the potential for reactivity with recycled concrete aggregates and for using mitigation options for this. So we, we started looking and you know most state DOTs are really allowing the use of recycled concrete aggregates as base or sub-base material. And, but there is a lot of interest in using the material in concrete. Certainly pavements are one of the areas that is maybe one of the most forgiving and one of the areas that people are looking at using them in before we maybe make the jump to structural concrete. So I think we're going to see this as, a, as, an, emerging, as an emerging issue. So we were using a, a highly reactive recycled concrete aggregate for part of this study. We also have been able to obtain some of the concrete from that bridge that was taken out of service in Quebec City, Canada, and use that in our studies as well. So just a snapshot on the test methods that we use. We're using the accelerated mortar bar test. Um, we're also using a, a relatively new test, a concrete microbar test. And you can see that this is a slightly larger specimen, a 1.6 by 1.6 um, inch cross section, and it's a little bit squatter, a little bit shorter, so about 6.3 inches. And what that allows us to do is to use a slightly larger size aggregate. So we can still use the accelerated test conditions of the accelerated mortar bar test, but we don't have to use all fine aggregate in the test. And then we're benchmarking this to concrete prism tests. And just to give you an idea of sample size, this is that ASTM C1260 bar on the left hand side. This is the, the concrete micro bar, the slightly squatter prism, and then the larger concrete prism, the three by three by 11 and a quarter inch prism. And this is one of my grad students who's, who's been doing work on this project. So I'm gonna keep this fairly brief, but I mentioned one of the things we were interested in looking at was the effect of the crushing procedure on alkali silica reaction. So we have two different types of material, either crushers fines or recrushed fines. So the crusher's fines are material that's produced when you take the bulk, the large pieces of recycled concrete aggregate that have been broken up into, let's say, foot-sized pieces out on site. They're brought back to a crushing operation and they're crushed down to something akin to, let's say, a coarse aggregate size. So we're talking about half inch, three-eighths inch, you know, three-quarter inch, one inch size aggregate. But there's a lot of very fine material that's produced during that crushing process. And so we have, we've obtained the crusher's fines from that process as one sample. Okay, so that's the first set of material we're looking at. We then also took the remaining larger size aggregate that was still there, so something on the order of the three to six inch size, and we've broken that up in the laboratory in our own laboratory crushing equipment so that we're preserving the slightly larger sizes. We're not using the very fine material that comes off at the back end. And what's really important to take away from this, these are four different sources of recycled concrete aggregates. The blue is the crusher's fines, and the red is the recrushed material. 
And what you see is that typically for all of these different types of, of reactive aggregates, the crusher's fines produce a lower level of expansion in the accelerated mortar bar test than the recrushed material. And what we've really shown is that the reason why is that this crusher's fine material has a much higher paste content to it. It doesn't have as much of the parent reactive aggregate in it. So if we use the recrushed material or this larger size material to begin with, we're, pre we're preserving more of the reactive aggregate as well as paste in that fraction and we see a higher reactivity level there. So the implication is that depending on what material you may be using from the crushing process, you may have different levels of reactivity and you need to be able to, to take that into account. So this is um, just a, a bit of a, a closer up graph on the very highly reactive aggregate if we're doing different replacement levels of the recycled concrete. So this would be combining what we know is a recycled concrete aggregate that's reactive with a non-reactive fine material in the test. So at 100% replacement, this is all a recycled concrete aggregate that we know is reactive. And the expansion limit in this test is 0.10% at 14 days. So right about here is where our expansion limit is. And at 14 days, the 100% replacement level doesn't really quite pass the test. If we get to a 50% or a 25% replacement level, we're getting to levels where we may actually pass the test, but certainly this upward trend is probably concerning. So we would want to do some sort of a mitigation measure for this. So we took the same aggregate at a 100% replacement level, and we started looking at different mitigation options. And so you can see this orange level, this orange line is a 40% replacement of fly ash. The blue line is 50% replacement of slag. And what we really noticed is that we're really not able to get the reaction under control even with a fairly high replacement level of fly ash or slag. And what we would need to do is we need to get into a, a ternary blend. So it's, this is a 25% fly ash replacement with 10% metakaolin and then a 40% slag with 10% metakaolin. And this is where we're really able to drop that reactivity level well below the 0.10%. So I think what we've, what we've seen is that we may need to have a slightly more aggressive approach with supplementary cementitious materials when we're using recycled concrete aggregates. Okay, so what about other mitigation options and what other testing things can we do? So what about using lightweight fine aggregate as a potential for reducing the expansion due to ASR? That could be an option. We've also seen a lot of agencies that are wanting to do combined aggregate testing. If we look back to the, the way that the test methods were originally developed, we're really only assessing either the reactivity of a fine aggregate or the reactivity of a coarse aggregate. So in ASTM C1260, we're typically not testing combinations of aggregates, but there's a lot of interest in doing that. And then lithium nitrate, as I mentioned, also might be another mitigation option. And just a takeaway that that dosage is highly dependent on the reactive aggregate type. So these are some of our, our preliminary results on using lightweight fine aggregate as a potential mitigation option. This is in the ASTM C1260 test. This purple line shows a highly reactive aggregate that we have in the Willamette Valley. This is 100% of that reactive aggregate. And at 14 days, you can see that we're almost at a 0.7% expansion level, so significantly above this 0.1% limit in the test. If we look at the lightweight fine aggregate, we're seeing that this is a completely non-reactive aggregate, so this is a 100% lightweight fine replacement level. And what we can see is that as we're increasing the dosage of the lightweight fine in the mixture, we are able to reduce um, the, uh, the alkali silica reaction in the mixture. So this may provide a way to beneficiate some of the aggregate with a different aggregate source and reduce the potential um, for reaction. And I think one of the takeaways, I'll mention this in a little bit, but also perhaps combining a partial replacement of lightweight fine with a supplementary cementitious material may be a viable option as well. So it's really about arming us with a, with a, variety, of different, a variety of different options for reducing the potential for reaction. Obviously this still needs to be benchmarked with ASTM C1293 testing and, and to get an idea of what actually happens in the field. But I wanted to draw your attention because we're, we're seeing this coming about in ASTM a lot. We see from a lot of state DOTs that they're wanting to do combined aggregate testing. And I wanted to mention to you that there are some potential pitfalls with this. 
So there are four graphs on, on this slide. And what you see in the upper left-hand graph are that we have the, the aggregates are denoted with just their abbreviations for their pit names so that I'm not throwing any aggregate producers under the, under the bus. But we have one reactive and one non-reactive aggregate here. And what you see is that the 100% reactive aggregate shows the highest level of expansion. And if we start replacing a portion of that highly reactive aggregate with the non-reactive, we are able to reduce the expansion. And that, this might be something that you would expect. Okay, and I think this is what a lot of people are thinking, or that, well, maybe we can beneficiate with a, with a non-reactive aggregate. Maybe we can combine two different types of reactive aggregates, and we would expect to see this trend. We also see this with another aggregate type. This is a slightly lower reactivity aggregate. You can see the 100% level in green is just barely failing the test at 14 days. And we see this same reduction in expansion at a 70-30% replacement or a 60-40. But what happens when we take an even different, a different source of a reactive aggregate with that same non-reactive? Now we see an inverse, okay? So we would actually see that the 100% replacement level, this is an aggregate that we know reacts in the field, it actually passes the test, and as we reduce the reactive aggregate source and we're starting to put in higher levels of the non-reactive, we're actually increasing the expansion. On the right-hand side, we also see in this lower right-hand corner when we combine two reactive aggregates together. This is 100% of the, of the SC reactive aggregate, but then when we start to combine it with another reactive aggregate, we're really greatly increasing the expansion in this test. And I, I think the takeaway from this is that, yes, you can put two different types of aggregates into the ASTM C1260 test, but the results that you get may not be what you expect, and we don't know how well that actually correlates to what's happening in the field. So be very cautious when you start doing the test if you're starting to do combined aggregate um, testing. There's obviously a lot more research and a lot more understanding that needs to be done here. Okay, so for our, for our future research needs, um, on the RCA reactivity side of things, we're working on the 1293 part to really benchmark this to concrete prism testing needs to be correlated to field performance, and we need to verify that the limits for ASTM C1260 or 1567 work well. We'll also mention the fact that a pessimum effect could exist for these replacement levels. What about the use of lightweight fine aggregate? Certainly it seems promising so far, but we need to determine is this a dilution effect or is there another benefit as well from using the lightweight fine aggregate? I think this is an area where we don't have a lot of information and it's a potential research area. We also need to look at ASTM C1293 testing and benchmarking that. And we want to look into this pessimum effect. If you're not familiar with the pessimum effect, what this basically says is that there's an ideal proportion of reactive silica coming from the aggregate to the amount of alkalis that we have in the system to produce the highest expansion. And a lot of what we're seeing in the combined aggregate testing side may be this pessimum effect. So we need to get a better idea on that and certainly correlation to field performance. So doing some outdoor exposure block testing and field trials is gonna be really important to see what the benefits are of using lightweight fine aggregate and potentially using it in combination with supplementary cementitious materials. So I know we're running close on time, so I just wanna mention um, kind of what's going on with testing standards and our guidance documents. And one of the things that we're really working towards is coming up with unified guidance, especially in ASTM. So we have a document out from the Federal Highway Administration. We also have a document out from AASHTO, it's PP65. And this provides a unified guidance on how you assess the potential for alkali aggregate reactivity and how you determine the effectiveness of mitigation options. And this document has just gone through a first ballot in ASTM. And we obviously have a bit of a ways to go before that's going to be a published document, but I would expect that sometime in the next 12 to 18 months, we're also going to have a document from ASTM that's fairly closely reflective of what the documents are from Federal Highway and from AASHTO, so that we really have unified guidance on what test methods to use, what expansion limits to use, and what supplementary cementitious materials to use. So, I'm just going to um, wrap up with a few perspectives. Accelerating our testing conditions certainly limits the reliability of test results that we have. Most SEMs can control ASR, provided that we use them in sufficient quantity. 
Remember that using them in ternary blends or in combination with other materials may also provide a benefit where you can use them at a lower level to maybe not impact, impact your constructability. Benchmarking to field performance is really crucial and utilizing a lot of information is critical, not just using one singular test method to evaluate the potential for reaction. Using field performance records, using information from a petrographer, and using the test methods that we have in combination is going to give us a better snapshot. But we really need to get to having the ideal test. We don't have that ideal test method yet, but hopefully we're going to be able to get there soon. So I just want to say thank you, I'll wrap up with a, a few references there and um, some shameless plugs for websites for my research group and for our Green Building Materials Lab at Oregon State University. And I'll open it up for any questions that you might have. Yeah. One of the questions, of course, from, from the department side and maybe also the field is the code or not the code. I'm talking about, of course, the reinforcing concrete enforcement and, of course, the something maybe corrosion on the rebar itself. Are there any kind of evidence of the, the outfly reaction with the rebar? Um, so the, the question was, and one of the one of the questions is, do you coat rebar or do you not coat rebar for potential corrosion issues? And do we have any evidence that there's an increase in potential for alkali silica reactivity? Um, so I would say that I'm not a corrosion expert. I won't pretend to to play one while I'm while I'm up here. Um, I would say we don't really have any evidence to suggest that there are any greater issues with alkali silica reactivity from coating or not coating the rebar. Um, I, but I do think there are potential issues that have been highlighted with epoxy coating um, rebar, you know, because you, it's, it's fairly difficult to install it perfectly every single time. And if you can get corrosion occurring localized and coming under that coating, you may lead to a problem where you don't get the evidence that you've got corrosion going on, where you would see cracking or you might see some spalling or, or efflorescence of corrosion products until you get to the point that you're actually popping off an entire section. So, like I said, I won't play the corrosion expert. I'm, I'm not one. Um, but I think there are concerns with epoxy coated, epoxy coated rebar, but not from an alkali silica reactivity standpoint. I've not seen that. Yeah? Right. And but when you're looking at time like that, that's the way to go. How how often would you think that that's necessary to establish solar aggregate? Okay, so so the, the question was how often would I recommend doing 1293 testing to basically benchmark what the reactivity from a an aggregate source is. Um, I think it's an excellent question and maybe a bit of a longer answer than what you than what you wanted, but I think one of the things that Canada is doing an excellent job of, and it's probably because they've known that they have an ASR problem and they've known for years that they have this issue, almost all of their quarries, and I believe their quarries are actually required to do ASTM C1260 testing. Of course, it's their Canadian Standards Association version. version. They're required to do 1293 testing, and they typically work with a petrographer. So I think my recommendation and one of the best things that we could do would be to be running 1260 tests. You know, oh, you know, we can continuously be running those because they're so rapid, right? You run the 1293 tests at a time when you know you're getting into a different area of the pit or the quarry. So if you're working with a petrographer there on site and you know that you're mining or you're blasting out the same rock type continuously, you can rely on the 1260 and 1293 tests that you've started with, right? But the second you start getting into a different seam of material, you need to be working with that petrographer to say, you know, what's really different about this? You run a 1260 test, and when that 1260 test doesn't match to a 1293, then you know you have a potential issue there. But you've obviously got to start doing the 1293s at some point. So I think yearly is probably a good recommendation with the caveat that if you are into a different area of the quarry, then you need to start doing a new 1293 and you need to start doing 1260s. So I think the 1260 test is a great benchmarking test. You know, it's a great rapid test that you can use to detect when you're getting to different parts of the, of the quarry, but you really need to have the 1293 tests, you know, already running so you can start to see, is there a difference here? And 
you know, I think too much of the time we say, well, we have to wait for one year to know what that exact value was. But if you're tracking the progression of the reaction over time, you can tell in a three to six month time period, am I following that same curve or am I much higher or am I much lower? And that may give you a red flag right away that you're in a different part of the quarry and maybe a supplementary cementitious material, you know, the option of how much you need may change. So I know that was kind of a long-winded answer to your question. I want to ask you about the, the lightweight aggregate slide you put up there. You mentioned it was about dilution. I mean, that's one of the possibilities. It's one of the possibilities, right. And in your research, are you going to be looking at the accommodation mechanism of maybe uh, the lightweight aggregate, the fact that it's porous, it could accommodate some of the ASR, and the fact that the material is slightly bosonic? So it's the surface of it is. Right, and, that, and that's... It's almost like a three-part thing. Absolutely, so that, that's one of the things that we need to look at. You know, just the, the initial snapshot at 1260 shows that it's promising, but we need to make the distinction of how much is a dilution effect, and certainly a dilution effect is fine on its own. You know, if you're able to pull out, uh, you know, enough of a reactive aggregate to get it below, below a point where it's reactive, that may be a benefit. But if there's a pozzolanic effect there as well, I think that's important to know because then if you can combine that with a supplementary cementitious material, you may have a, a good synergy that exists there um, where you may not need, let's say, 40% fly ash, but maybe 20 or 25% fly ash in combination with a certain percentage of lightweight. I think there's a lot of possibilities there, but I think this is still a fairly new research area. It's not something that we really know a lot about or understand very well. There may be a way for it to accommodate some of the gel as well. I, I'm a little reluctant to to hang my hat, let's say, on something where you're saying I'm going to still allow the reaction to happen and accommodate some of the gel from it, I think we'd rather try and limit it from, from happening at all. So knowing if it's a pozzolanic effect, I think, is an important thing to find out. I have some old stuff I found in our library, which I'll send you. Okay. I'll copy it. Yeah, I think that'd be very useful. Any other questions? I think we're, we're actually right back on, back on time, so it's right at noon, so I'm no longer standing between you and lunch. So thank you very much, and I'll stay up here if you have any more questions. <laughs>